Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for talking to the Voice of America Persian. You chaired the task force for the future of Iraq, yet the report mentions Iran 29 times. Is there any reason for mentioning Iran so many times? And is it because of the concerns that you had on what you have called the expansion of Iran's influence in the region and in Iraq? That's absolutely the case. Um, when one looks back to the time I left Iraq as ambassador in early 2009, uh, uh, Clearly, the Iranians were present and players, but their influence, and I have to say their malign influence, um, is now far more dramatic and meaningful than it was uh, just, just a few years ago. Their support for the um, popular mobilization units uh, that have some very nasty people uh, running them uh, seems to me to be aimed at ensuring that Iraq does not develop as a, uh, a successful, secure, and prosperous state. So we are uh, in direct opposition to um, not an Iranian role, uh, but this Iranian role. They are uh, putting the lives of so many Iraqis at risk by their policies. Mr. Ambassador, the report mentions the export of Iraqi Shia fighters into Syria organized by the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. What could the United States and Iraq do to stop this deadly export? The word engage may not be mentioned 29 times in the report, but that's the basic message. Uh, the United States has disengaged uh, in Iraq. Uh, we are treating the Islamic State as a purely military problem and ignoring the fact that uh, uh, it's not the problem itself. Uh, Islamic State is the symptom of a problem, uh, that uh, the country is fragmented. Uh, many Iraqis feel disenfranchised, um, uh, and that has led to the disorder uh, we're seeing right now. Uh, so the first thing the United States has to do is decide that uh, Iraq is a significant security and political issue for this country. Um, if that commitment is made, uh, you know, then in concert with our uh, Iraqi friends, we can talk about a way forward. Uh, who should do what? What are the priorities? Uh, because right now, we're engaged militarily, but we're not engaged politically, and this is a political problem. Uh, the report also recommends that Iraq reduces its reliance uh, on uh, the import of gas from Iran. Is this a realistic recommendation? Uh, I, uh, I, am, I am told that it is uh, by people, and we had a very broad task force as you will have seen, uh, you know, quite a brain trust. I was uh, honored to, to be asked to, um, uh, to chair it. So th they, they tell me there are alternatives. How could this be achieved? Uh, again, I'm not the uh, energy expert. Uh, uh, I know there are several proposals, including some from U.S. companies, um, on uh, ways to meet uh, Iraqi energy needs without having to rely on imports. Uh, the, um, we understand about the need for energy, goodness knows, we all, we all have it, uh, but a dependence on one particular country for something as critical as energy is, in our view, not a good position for Iraq to be in. It, it, uh, it just gives the Iranians uh, leverage uh, in other domains. So, uh, you know, they, we think as a task force, uh, and again, I, I, I'm saying we, not me, because uh, I am not an energy specialist, that there, there are alternatives. One of the problems that you raise in the report is corruption in Iraq. And if I may, I'd like to quote what you have written, or the report mentions, that there are measures that would prevent political elites from safely parking the proceeds of corruption in Western capitals. Could this be done, and haven't we done this before? We have made a major effort <coughs> on terrorist financing, for example, after 9-11. Uh, and broadly speaking, a, a successful effort. Uh, uh, before 9-11, uh, terror organizations could move money pretty freely around the world. Uh, 
we're now in a situation where they can't. So what can be done uh, against terrorist financing uh, uh, can also be done with respect to corruption. Uh, uh, the decision just needs to be made that that's the direction uh, that um, Iraq wants to go as well as the international community. Uh, how involved do you think Iran is in the um, let's say the illicit the proceeds of this corruption in Iraq and how much do you think the IRGC is involved in that? Uh, well I, I would just <coughs> look at the role the IRGC uh, plays economically within Iran. Um, they have a number of front companies that seem to be pretty profitable business for them. So I, anywhere where you see a, um, a PMU element uh, that uh, has ties to Iran, uh, you, you will see not only a security relationship, but you'll see a financial relationship too. Mr. Professor, if I may, I'd like to quote again from the report. Uh, there must be a greatly enhanced public diplomacy strategy in Iraq to communicate to the population that the United States seeks to support stability and growth for the country. At present, the Iranian propaganda is far more effective than U.S. efforts. Would you please elaborate on that? Uh, that has been the case not only in Iraq, but uh, in other countries. I, reopened our embassy in Afghanistan uh, after uh, the fall of the Taliban uh, in the months uh, uh, after 9-11. And in Afghanistan, we saw the Iranians had made a major effort uh, to uh, develop and use a media presence um, to uh, basically propagate their view of, um, of things in Afghanistan. Uh, I often worry that we simply haven't made this a high enough priority, uh, uh, which is why you have that reference in the report, that uh, uh, Iraqis need to see that we are committed to a better future at every level, uh, economic, security, uh, everything, because that's what we have been doing, less now than in the past, but, but those remain our goals. So. I'd like to see us um, uh, uh, make this a higher priority. Uh, your report offers recommendations to the Trump administration and you stress that by supporting Iraq, the United States would limit Iran's capacity to project power across the Middle East. Did you send this report uh, to the White House? And if so, have you gotten any response from the Trump administration? Yes, that was one of our key recommendations uh, because it, what, what you're seeing through the, uh, particularly through the PMUs, that um, uh, there is now um, a highway, if you will, almost literally, uh, from from Iran straight west to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, via Iraq, via Syria, via Lebanon. Uh, uh, this is a huge problem for the countries involved. Uh, and also, I think, for international peace and security. Um, uh, it's also always useful to look at history in these matters. Um, uh, Iran, at the time of the Shah, uh, also projected power beyond its borders. Um, it uh, was the Shah's Iran that seized the islands from um, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Um, it was the Shah's Iran who sent basically a, a mechanized infantry brigade into Oman in the 70s to help the Sultan put down a rebellion. Uh, so you're, you're really seeing the same thing now. Uh, Iran sees itself as a leading power in the region uh, and it will also uh, project power beyond its borders. But instead of using regular forces, it relies on terrorist groups. Um, in, again, in Syria, um, in Lebanon, and in Iraq. So uh, revolutions come, uh, sweeping changes are made, but uh, geopolitically, um, there's a consistent theme here, uh, that, that Tehran considers itself um, uh, a, a regional superpower. Uh, and it will project, it, it will do everything it can to project that power in ways that are extremely harmful 
uh, to the region and indeed a threat to international security.